Let's turn to, actually it'll be on your screen, Daniel 8, 14. This is what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, or the last few times I've spoken, I should say. Daniel 8, 14. And he said unto me, Under 2,300 days, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Remember that as we've studied the Word of God, we discovered in Daniel 9 that the beginning of the 2,300 day year prophecy, remember 2,300 days in prophecy equals actually 2,300 years, began in 457 BC with a command to restore and to build Jerusalem. We also discovered that the earthly sanctuary that God had Moses build was after the pattern of the heavenly sanctuary. Not only were the physical components of the sanctuary patterned after the heavenly, but so were its services. We also discovered the sanctuary service of the Day of Atonement that occurred once every year for the cleansing of the earthly sanctuary with the service of the high priest performed. To cleanse it from the, the blood of the sin offerings and how the sin, off, oh, the sin of the people is also transferred the, to the sanctuary through the priest eating of the flesh of some of the sin offerings. We also looked at the book of Hebrews to discover that after Jesus' death, he rose and became our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. And in the heavenly sanctuary, the, that service of cleansing the sanctuary that we see here in Daniel 8, 14, will be performed only once in the end of the world. So if the text of Daniel 18, 4, 8, 14 is referring to the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, which began in 1844, let's review a portion of scripture from Leviticus. This is Leviticus 4, 4 through 6, and this is the sin offering that's being described here. Verse 4, And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head, and kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. This sin offering is for the forgiveness of sin in the earthly sanctuary. This process, during this process, the sinner would bring his offering and he would lay his hand upon the animal and confess his sins. Then he would kill the animal because the wages of sin is death. The priest would take some of the blood and sprinkle it before the veil between the holy and most holy place, which represented the transfer of sin from the sinner to the sanctuary by the blood of this innocent animal. This took the place of the death of the sinner. Then once a year on the Day of Atonement, the sanctuary and the, and the congregation would be cleansed from these sins. So it leads us to a question. What is there in the heavenly sanctuary that requires cleansing? Let's look and see what the Bible says. Hang in there, okay? It's going to take a little while to make my point. Psalms 56, 8. Thou tellest my wonderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Here in Psalms 56, David is talking to God. He already understands that God has a book that records events and happenings in one's life. Let's continue in our investigation here. Isaiah 65, verses 1 through 7. As, as you know, when I get up here and talk, I use scripture after scripture after scripture. And that's what we're going to be doing today. 
looking to see what the Bible says. It's not me saying it. It's what the Bible says. Verse 1 of Isaiah 65. I am sought of them that asked not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all day long to rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. A people that provoked me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificed in the gardens and burned incense upon the altars of brick which remain among the graves and lodge in the, in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh, and broth of abominable things is in their vessels. This is a prophecy that God is saying, I'm going to be sought by people that are not called by my name. He's talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about you and me. In verse 2, he says, I've spread my hands out all day long to rebellious people, which walked in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Talking about Israel, a nation that was called by his name. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we have the famous scripture, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their lands. But here in verse two, he says, these are the rebellious people who walk in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Isaiah 55, eight and nine says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let's continue in Isaiah 65, which say, this is talking still about this rebellious people, the, the nation of Israel, which say, stand by thyself, come not near me, for I am holier than to thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. You've never, ever been in a smoky condition? It's irritating. You can't get away from it. Behold, it is written before me. I will not keep silent, but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills, Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. Behold, it is written before me, there's a record of these things that are happening. Notice in verse 7, therefore I will measure their former work. This word in the Hebrew is, is madad. It means properly to stretch by implication to measure, if by stretching a line. Rick, in construction, you use lines, don't you? A, a plummet line to make sure things are straight up and down. A line, if you're doing masonry work, to make sure the brick are level, the block are level. You examine whether or not things are going along the way they should be. Here in verse 7, God is saying, therefore I will examine their former work into their bosom. Let's look, let's look at the words of Jesus. In Matthew 12, verses 33 through 37. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, talking to the leader, religious leaders of the day, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Can you see the implication here of what Jesus is saying? That what we say is a reflection of what is in our hearts. It is being recorded in heaven and will be used in the day of judgment to justify us or to condemn us. Malachi 3.16 Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. A book of remembrance for those that feared God, that thought about his name. Other, other evidence of a record of what's happening on this earth. Okay, let's keep looking and see what else the Bible says about this idea of books and records, and examination. Exodus 32, verses 31 through 32. This is when Moses came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments and the people had created this golden calf that Aaron happened to just create out of nothing, Rick. And... God was angry. And Moses returned on the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and we have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Again, evidence of the record of events in one's life on the earth kept in heaven. Revelation 3, verse 5. This is Revelation 2 and 3 is the record of Christ speaking to the seven churches. Verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out, blot out his name out of the book of life but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So we can see that there are records in heaven of words, actions, either good or bad, that are kept in, books, in the books of heaven. So let's continue to see how this applies to this cleansing of the sanctuary, to this time in which we are currently living. I'll go to the scripture reading from this morning. Found in Malachi, chapter three, verses one through five. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall come, suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant who he delight in, below, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. This is Christ suddenly coming into the most holy place of the temple. Who may, be, who may abide the day of his coming? Verse 2. And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may Offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Here Christ is suddenly coming to the most holy place of the temple in heaven to perform the work of cleansing those, to purifying those who claim to be of God's kingdom. 
just as in the day of atonement for the earthly sanctuary. Continuing on in verse 4. And then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. And I will come near to you to judgment. And it will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against the false swearers, against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Christ is coming to the most holy place, not only for the process of purification, but also for judgment requiring an examination of those, again, claiming to be of God's kingdom. So when Jesus suddenly comes to the temple, like a thief in the night, to the most holy places, our high priest, part of his work is that a refining, purifying his people. The other part of the judgment. Let's look at some other scripture that tells us about the refining process. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at verses 26 through 30. O daughter of my people, talking about Israel, Gird thee with sackcloth, wallow thyself in ashes, make thee mourning as for an only son, most bitter lamentation. For the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people that thou mayest know and try their ways. They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanderers. They are brass and iron. They are all corruptors. The bellows are burned. The lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth in band, for the wicked are not plucked away. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. The people of God are to go through a refining process to prepare for the day of judgment. But, that, but at some point, there is nothing more that can be done. The tools that are used for the refining are no, no longer effective. The bellows are burned and no longer work. The lead is consumed and no longer available for use. The wicked that are left are called reprobate sober rejected by God. Are you beginning to see the need for the presence of Christ in your heart? For it is only through the power of a living Christ that sin can be overcome in our lives. This is the essential part of the gospel that no one wants to talk about. But it's so vital in the plan of salvation. If you understand the second part of the gospel story, the results of living and the results of a living Christ in your heart, it should give you great hope. And this message today should not be scary to you, but a reminder of the need we all have for this gift of Jesus in our life today. Hebrews 12, 6 through 11. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye, being without chastisement, whereof all are, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards, not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reference. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he, talking about God, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. 
Now, no chastisement for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruits of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. This purifier, purifying process is not a pleasant thing. It can make you uncomfortable. It can be difficult to go through. But it is a necessary process so that we might be partakers of the holiness of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. That we may be offered unto the Lord in an offering of righteousness. Let's look further into the issue of judgment. Revelation 3.19 As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be jealous, therefore, and repent. This is Jesus. He's talking to the church of Laodicea. The last of the seven churches, which represents the time period in which we're living now. As many as I love are rebuke and chasten, and be jealous therefore and repent. Why? Daniel 7, 9 through 10 will tell us why. Verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, the Ancient of Days did sit whose garment was white as snow, and hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. This is the cleansing of the sanctuary. This is judgment. This is an examination of our lives, of our words, our actions, our thoughts, our behaviors. You see what the heavenly sanctuary contains that needs to be cleansed. Besides the cleansing of God's people through the purification process are the records of sin in heaven in the books. There is the book of life, the book of remembrance of those who thought and talked about God. The books of the records of our lives where every word, thought, and action are recorded. Remember Matthew 12, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment to the records in these books. For thou, by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. This is the cleansing in the sanctuary in heaven. That process that, begin, that began in 1844, that only happens once at the end of the world, according to Hebrews chapter 9. Let's look at another description of this event in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. With verse 17, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and, they, and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou should give us reward unto the ser thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. <coughs> And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in the temple the Ark of the Testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunders and earthquake and great hail. Temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen the Ark of his Testament. Where is the Ark of the Testament? In the most holy place. When is the most holy place opened? The Day of Atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary, where judgment occurs. What's inside this Ark of the Testament? 
the Ten Commandments, the standard of judgment. You say, hey, wait, wait, Ed, you probably don't know this. Don't you know that the Old Covenant is not in effect anymore? Really? What does the New Covenant say? Let's look and see. Hebrews 8, verses 7 through 10. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So there's something wrong with this first covenant. Let's see what is wrong with it. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because this is what's wrong with it. They continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Remember, the first covenant, this, this event that happened when God came down to meet them on Mount Sinai. He presented his law before them in the form of Ten Commandments. And they said, everything that the Lord says we will do, this contract that they made with God. And the problem was nothing with the Ten Commandments. The problem was they continued not in it. They did not keep up their part of the bargain of the contract. So what is this new covenant then? Is it doing away with the, God, the Ten Commandments, with the law of God? Verse 10, for this is the covenant, this is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them into their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. God's law has not been done away with. The only thing that's changed about God's law is its location. Being put into the hearts and minds of his people. Folks, this is the standard of judgment. Look into God's word, read it for yourself. Acts 17, verses 26 through 31. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for, for to dwell on the face of the earth. And, is, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might thought, feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. God is available. He's not that far away from any one of us. We need to seek him. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we, all, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we not, ought not to think of the God that is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art or man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man in whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he has raised him from the dead. This is talking about the cleansing of the sanctuary. Where he is appointed a day in which we will, Christ will judge the world. Well, let's look further on this idea of a judgment. First Peter chapter four verses seventeen through nineteen. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begins at us. What shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? 
And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Who is the creator according to this verse? Is God, Jehovah. The house of God, those that claim to be his. Jesus came to do the will of his Father, and so should we, as we commit our souls to him in well-doing, doing his will. Revelation 11, 1. And there was given to me a reed like a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Again, this idea of judgment. Judgment of them that worship in. Cleansing of the sanctuary of God. Revelation 21.10. And he carried me away into the spirit into a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Continuing on to the verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, whether whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You see, this idea of judgment is to make sure that anyone who enters into eternal life is safe to save by looking at the record of their lives, to seeing what the blood of Jesus has done to, co to cover their confessed sins, to see how the purification process of Christ in you, to see how our characters are being transformed to become an offering of righteousness to God. Let me ask you again. Do you continue to see the need of Jesus in your life? To have his shed blood as a covering for your sin, to have his spirit living in you, to empower you to overcome the sin in your life. To experience being covered by a robe of his righteousness. This can be only accomplished through Christ. There was no one else that can do this. You may say, hey, Ed, I don't believe it. I don't believe what you're telling me. Most churches don't teach anything like this. I want to take you to a scripture in Isaiah. Isaiah 28, verses 14 through 21. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule the people which is in Jerusalem. He's talking to leaders of the, the nation of Israel, the religious leaders. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell we are at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lives our, lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. They have convinced themselves that falsehood is truth. And they say, when that time comes, when the scourge shall pass through, it won't affect us because we've made this covenant with death and held through this, through lies and falsehood. What is God's response? Therefore saith the Lord God, behold, I will lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, the truth, not a lie, the truth. The contemporary English version puts verse 16 like this. I am laying a firm foundation for the city of Zion, 
It is a valuable cornerstone proven to be trustworthy. No one who trusts in no one who trusts it will ever be disappointed. Easy to read version. Because of these things, the Lord God says, I will put a rock, a cornerstone, in the ground of Zion. This will be a very precious stone. Everything will be built upon this very important rock. Anyone who trusts in that rock will be, not be, be disappointed. The Good News Bible. This now is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am placing in Zion a foundation that is firm and strong. In it, I am putting a solid cornerstone on which are written the words, faith that is firm is also patient. Last one in God's word. This is what the Almighty Lord says. I am going to lay a rock in Zion, a rock that has been tested, a precious cornerstone, a solid foundation. Whoever believes in him will not worry. We shouldn't worry about judgment. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you are allowing him to work in your life, if you're seeking to, to have the fruits of the spirit of his presence in your life, the idea of judgment should not be of a concern to you because whoever believes in Christ will not worry. But we need to be aware that this is happening. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall, sleep, shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then you shall be trodden down by it. From the time that it goes forth, it shall take you. For morning by morning shall it pass over, by day and by night, and it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. For the bed is shorter than a man can stretch himself upon, and the covering narrower than he can wrap himself in. For the Lord shall rise up as Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. The refuge of lies, the hiding place of falsehoods, leads one to a condition where the bed is too short to stretch on, the covering too narrow to cover oneself with. They'll find themselves not prepared, not passing judgment of God. What is this strange act that's being talked about here that God will do in his wrath? Let's look at the book of Revelation. Chapter 14, verses 9 through 12. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive the mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. What are the fruits of the Spirit of Christ in us? According to Galatians 5, 
as the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against which there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. The presence of Christ in one's life leads to these fruits, which is not against the law of God, the Ten Commandments. And thus the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God, because they're walking in the Spirit and the faith of Jesus. Malachi 4, 1 through 6. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all they that do wickedly, shall be as stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise, speaking of Christ, arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. For those that believe the previous text teaches an everlasting hell, this text you can clearly see see that it does not. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in horror before all nations with statues and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful, dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. I'm sure most of you have stopped, have been required to stop, and see what's happening in the world around us. Are you aware of the time in which we're living? Revelation 3, the church of Laodicea, verses 14 through 20. And, into the, and unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. This is Jesus speaking. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I'm good. I'm a good person. I go to church. Do you really realize your condition? Continuing on, verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and the, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame 
and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Remember what the book of Leviticus says about the Day of Atonement? Let's go look real quick. Leviticus 16, 29 through 30. And this shall be a statue forever unto you, that in the seventh month and the tenth day of the year, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, and for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priest, and for all the people of the congregation. So what does that look like today? Or the new covenant? Second Corinthians thirteen five. It says, Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, but that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Reprobate silver, rejected by God because you've rejected the refining of God and his son. You've rejected the spirit of Christ that God has sent into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. The bellows are burned and can no longer function. There is no more lead for use in the purification process. There is nothing else God can do. Matthew, parable of Jesus, Matthew 22, 1 through 14. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and treated them spitefully, spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they were, which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So when these servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they could find, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there was a man which had not on a wedding gar garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou into hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into utter darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The judgment of Daniel 7. This man was found without the wedding garment, without the covering of the righteousness of Christ. So what happens next in this most holy place? 
and the cleansing of the sanctuary. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and they came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is a last, everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Here Christ is coming in the clouds to the Ancient of Days, which is Jehovah. Not as a high priest anymore, but as a king that is to receive his kingdom. This scene is in heaven. It is the marriage of the Lamb. Before you protest too much about what I just said, Let's look and see what the Bible says. Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 33. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And behold, thou shalt receive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Just as Daniel says, an everlasting kingdom. That Christ is receiving the throne of David from the Ancient of Days. Revelation 19, 6 through 9. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and the voice of a mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and, the wife, and his wife hath made herself ready. And it was granted that she be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true saints of God. The marriage of the Lamb, who is Jesus Christ, with the wife having made herself ready, Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Another parable about a marriage supper found in Luke chapter 14, 16 through 24. Starting with verse 16, Then he said unto me, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. And he sent his servant at the supper time, saying to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuses. The first said unto them, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I, I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring, her, bring in thither, hither the poor, and the maim, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be fulfilled, be filled. For I say unto you that none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Is this where we're at today? Have those that God has invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb refused the invitation? 
Are we to invite the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind, and those in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that God's house may be fulfilled, be filled? By the way, who or what is the Lamb's wife? Do you know what the Bible says? If I were to show these next few texts in most Christian churches, I'd probably end up being stoned. But this is what God's Word says. Revelation 21, 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The New Jerusalem, prepared for a bride for a husband. Now, what was the capital of David's kingdom on earth? Wasn't that Jerusalem? Remember in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus comes to the Ancient of Days to receive a kingdom. And what did we just read in Revelation 19, 19? Blessed are they that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's look at the next slide. Then there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show you thee, thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Notice it doesn't say the lamb's fiance. And then he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. The new Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven where the marriage has already occurred. The new Jerusalem is coming down as the wife of the lamb. Not what you expect the Bible to say. This is the verse I showed to a friend of mine a number of years ago. He said, that's not right. I didn't write these words. I'm just sharing them with you. Study for yourself. See what the Bible says for yourself. Revelation 22, getting to the end of the Bible, the end of the books of the Bible, the end of the book, of the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And he saith unto me, seal not the saying of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. The end of the cleansing of the sanctuary. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Christ is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and the first and last of the gospel, the, salva the plan of salvation. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Blessed are they that do his commandments. There's that word again, commandments. Christ is referring to the commandments of God, his Father, the Ten Commandments. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without our dogs and sorcerers and 
whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bride of the morning star. And the spirit and the bride says, come. Who is the spirit? Who is the husband of the bride? It's Jesus. Come, let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Are you seeking living water? Have you accepted the invitation of Jesus knocking on the door of your heart? Are you buying of him gold tried in fire, the riches of an indwelling Christ in our hearts? the white raiment of his righteousness to hide our nakedness. I have so that we can see the full gospel story, all freely giving to those that seek it. I pray that you, that I, will seek these things daily while they still yet may be found, that we will be found acceptable to God in this day of judgment that is here and now. The words of Jesus in Revelation 3. Remember therefore, therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore shall not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Watch and be ready. Listen to the warnings given in the Word of God. Spend time studying the Word to see if these things you hear today are really so. For one day, the trump of God will sound, and we will see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. Be ye ready.